Hey everyone, how are you? My name is Adam Shopcorn. Um, that's my wife, Carolyn Angel. Um, we started Fort Gansevoir approximately 18 months ago. Um, thank you to everyone for being with us today. Um, thank you to Barbara and Mika at New Directions. Uh, thanks to Elliot Weinberger and Lydia Davis for being here with us. Um, and thank you to uh, Alan Cody, whose uh, great show is throughout the three floors of the building. We encourage you, um, after the readings, uh, to have a look on the third floor if you have, have not gotten up there. Um, and yeah, enjoy. Um, this is a real treat, and uh, thank you guys for making the time. Thanks, Adam. Um, and yep, welcome to the second event of our reading series with Fort Gansport Gallery. This afternoon we are joined by Lydia Davis and Elliot Weinberger. Lydia Davis is a translator and author of one novel and seven story collections. Publishers Weekly describes reading her translation of Swan's Way as similar to encountering an old master painting that has just been cleaned. Her newest translation is Letters to His Neighbor by Marcel Proust. Elliot Weinberger has been published by New Directions for close to 40 years as an essayist, translator, and editor. His essays have been called unclassifiable by the New Yorker and dense collages of magical facts by the New York Times. His newest collection is The Ghost of Birds. Please join me in welcoming Lydia and Elliot. I think I'll, I'll stand up. Um, we debated it. who should go first. It was an impossible, <laughs> impossible decision. But I, I want to go first so I can relax and listen to Elliot, <laughs> selfishly. Um, so we're, we'll keep to about 20 minutes each, and um, so I wanted to say a few words about uh, Letters to His Neighbor by Proust, um, which isn't out yet. I guess it's going to come out this summer. It keeps getting postponed because we have editorial difficulties, which I'll explain. Um, I thought this would be a simple job. There are 26 letters, and I, um, I thought it would be enjoyable and simple to translate them. But then, as happens when you get involved in the project, it gets more and more complicated. You get more and more committed to it in more and more different ways. So I ended up um, writing quite a long afterward because I felt the forward, although it, it sort of set the scene a bit, didn't really uh, show you where Proust was when he was writing these letters and the life in the building and his relationships and just his room, his very strange room. Um, so I went on and on and so far New Directions has been very tolerant. We haven't done the final edit yet so maybe a little, I was rereading it today and I do go on a bit about the different numbering systems of, of French floors in the building <laughs> as opposed to American numbering systems and that sort of thing. Um, and then the, the, the French editors, I have to say, had, had not sort of noticed, uh, well, I have to say Proust does not date his letters normally. <coughs> so um, these are letters to his upstairs neighbor, who is Madame Williams. She's, she's married to an American dentist. And the dentist's office is on the floor above Proust, and the apartment of the dentist and his wife and child are on the next floor up. And he's basically writing, as you can imagine, about the noise, but he writes about other things too. Uh, and he uh, lived in the building from 1908 to 1919, so we know the letters were written in that time span. And then sometimes there's a letter that mentions a specific uh, say the opening of a, of a performance or the death of a friend, so you know much more specifically when that letter was written. And then you try to date the other letters according to, well, sort of around the more definite letters, you know, the same friend was mentioned in this letter, or the same subjects were mentioned in this letter. But um, we discovered some things that, that, that weren't right in the French um, dating. 
So we got very involved in that. Okay, this letter couldn't have been written now. It, it had to be written then, and that means that this letter might be there. And um, we ended up hiring a research assistant and spending, oh, long times, because you would say, well, they, roses, you know, roses um, in verse are mentioned in this letter, this letter, this letter, and this letter. And this friend is mentioned in this letter, that, you know, and they somewhat overlap. And Jeet is mentioned in these two letters, and Swan's Away is mentioned in these two letters. So you'd think you want it all to work out neatly, but it doesn't always. <laughs> and, it, and so we, we spent countless hours, and it's still not over yet. I'm still fighting to put one letter at the end, and we do have to sort of get the French editor's permission on these because it is edited by him. Um, so the other thing to explain is, well, I guess I explained the layout of the building. Um, there are 26 letters. 23 of them are to Madame Williams, and three are to her husband. And um, they're about the noise, they're about the First World War, which um, began and continued during that time. And they're about <coughs> flowers, they're about mutual friends, they're a little bit about Swan's Way. Um, and they're very gracious letters, and they're also occasionally quite funny, just because he's going into such detail about the noise. and. Um, as you probably know, he would begin his work day. He would wake up for the day at about 9 in the evening. And he would get a, a cup of coffee and a croissant from his uh, housekeeper companion, Celeste. And then he would work through the night. And he had terrible trouble with asthma, so he would burn what he called le gras powders, or what were called le gras powders that apparently helped him but would also seep under the doors into the hallways and sometimes bother the neighbors. <laughs> um, he was very eccentric about, he would hire musicians to come and play at one in the morning by paying them fantastic sums of money. And um, very strange, but I found translating Swan's Way, I, I really warmed to him. I found, for all his strangeness, he was a very generous person and very, and very kind to friends and neighbors. So I'll, I'll just start in reading and I'm going to end with one of the favorite, one of my favorites. Madame, your letters are Parthian letters. You give me so great a desire and almost your permission to see you. And then at the very moment that I receive the letter, you have left. My most ardent hope is that the coming year may bring the softening, I won't say the forgetting, since memory is the proud treasure of wounded hearts, of the trials which the year that is ending has brought you. In this hope I include with you the doctor, that's her husband, whom I do not know but whose praises I hear sung by Madame Strauss by everyone, and very particularly your son who had promised to express his desires to me so that I could satisfy them, and whose discretion, please tell him, is not at all friendly. Please accept, Madame, my gratitude for all your, for your kind concern over my rest. My most respectful greetings, Marcel Proust. His syntax, he, he writes in a great hurry, and his syntax is, is very uh, much without commas. And I tried to honor all his um, all his choices in that regard. Madame, I thank you with all my heart for your beautiful and good letter and come to ask you, on the contrary, to allow all possible noise to be made starting now. <laughs> I had in fact not anticipated a shortness of breath so severe that it prevents me from trying to sleep. Noise will therefore not bother me in the least and will be all the more relief for me on a day on which I could rest. It saddens me very much to learn that you are ill. If bed does not bore you too much, I believe that in itself it exerts a very sedative <coughs> effect on the kidneys. But perhaps you are bored, though it seems to me difficult to be bored with you. Couldn't I send you some books? Tell me what would distract you. 
I would be so pleased. Don't speak of annoying neighbors, but of neighbors so charming. An association of words contradictory in principle, since Montesquieu claims that most horrible of all are, one, neighbors, two, the smell of post offices. <laughs> that they leave the constant tantalizing regret that one cannot take advantage of their neighborliness. Be so good, madam, as to recall me to the doctor and accept my respectful and grateful greetings, Marcel Proust. Despite the gloomy days, would some flowers please you? And which, as Verlaine says. Mm -hmm. Madame, I envy your beautiful memories. No doubt, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to read the whole of that one. He's talking about various places. She, she has houses and she has stayed for the summer. And then down to the noise at the very end. So he, he, he wants to lead up to the noise, but he'll be very gracious in the meantime, talking about other things. You are very good to think of the noise. It has been moderate up to now and relatively close to silence. These days, a plumber has been coming every morning from 7 to 9. This is the time he had no doubt chosen. I cannot say that in this my preferences agree with his, but he has been very tolerable, and, and really everything has been. Please accept, madame, my respectful greetings and sincere obeisance. And then this I thought was interesting because here he does talk about Swan's way a bit. I meant to say that these, these letters, you know, when, when you have a figure like Proust, every new piece of material relating to the person is, is valued, highly valued, even if it throws only a tiny bit of light on some little aspect of the life. But here he talks a bit about, about the actual book. Madame, the Nouvelle Revue Française has published my excerpts in two issues, June and July. If I send you three, two issues of July, it is because, alas, I can only have copies which have been torn apart in order to glue pieces of the Montproofs of the second volume, which was supposed to appear then, and which the Aspera Fata prevented. I think that's the reference to the war. But the pieces cut out should not be the same in the two issues. With the two, you will have a single complete one. And alas, I will no doubt be obliged to ask you for them back later. But naturally, you will have the whole work in one volume. I will send it to you complete. What I said to you about the real meaning of each part being conferred on them only by the following part, you can find an example of in the June issue. In Swan, one might be surprised that Swan should always be entrusting his wife to Monsieur Chalus, presumed to be her lover. Or rather, one might be surprised that the author should go to the trouble of publishing yet again after so many vaudevillians of the lowest sort, that blindness of husbands or of lovers. Yet in the June issue, you will see, since the first indication of Monsieur de Chalus's vice, that's his homosexuality, appears there, that the reason why Swann knew he could entrust his wife to Monsieur de Chalus was quite different. But I had not wanted to announce it in the first volume, preferring to resign myself to being very banal, so that one might be introduced to the characters as in life, where people reveal themselves only little by little. Starting with the third volume, moreover, one will see that Swann has nevertheless been mistaken Monsieur de Chalus had had relations with only one woman, and it was precisely Odette. It pains me to think that you are ill and cloistered. I would so much like nephritis and neuritis to be no more than a bad memory that would not prevent you in any way from leading a pleasant life. But I think that your company is worth more than that of others, which is for you a reason quite personal for appreciating solitude. Please accept, madame, my very respectful greetings.
Madame, I had ordered these flowers for you, and I am in despair that they are coming on a day when, against all expectations, I feel so ill that I would like to ask you for silence tomorrow, Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, as this request is in no way conjoined with the flowers, causing them to lose all their fragrance as disinterested mark of respect and to bristle with nasty thorns, I would like even more not to ask you for this silence. You follow that complicated reason. <laughs> His flowers will become suspect if he asks for a favor. If you are remaining as I am in Paris, and if one evening I were not suffering too much, I would like, since the doctor and your son, I believe, have left, and perhaps you are feeling a little lonely, to come up sometime in the next few weeks to keep you company. Now it's unclear. He seems to have visited her one time but it's unclear if he ever visited her again. But actually doing this encounters so many obstacles. I have, and then he gives an example of his problem visiting Clary, one of the, one of the friends whose death was a clue to the dating of a later letter. I have three times in the evening, and with what difficulty, hired rather leisurely carriages to go see Clary who Madame Raybinder said was asking to see me. The first time I went with Madame de la Béraudière to the Rue du Colisée, where we were told he no longer lived and was at 32 Rue Galli Colisée. <coughs> at 32 Rue Galilée, the concierge got out of bed to tell us that he did not know Clary. Madame Raybinder corrected the mistake and told me that he lived at 33. I went off again another evening when I rang at number 33, a fantastic house, with no cloudy. Finally, on the third attempt, I got it right with number 37. I mistook the floor. The elevator went up to the top, causing me to do the opposite of what the doctor's clients do each day, ringing at my door. <laughs> when I went back down, I felt that the concierge would not let me go up again, swearing to me that Clary had gone to bed. You are very respectful and devoted, <laughs> Marcel. <laughs> okay, one, one last one. I hope that you will not find me too indiscreet. I have had a great deal of noise these past few days, and as I am not well, I am more sensitive to it. I have learned that the doctor is leaving Paris after tomorrow, and can imagine all that this implies for tomorrow concerning the nailing of crates. <laughs> Would it be possible either to nail the crates this evening or else not to nail them till tomorrow starting at 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon? If my attack finishes earlier, I would hasten to let you know. <laughs> or else, if it is indispensable to nail them in the morning, to nail them in the part of your apartment that is above my kitchen and not that which is above my bedroom. I call above my bedroom that which is also above the adjoining rooms and even on the fourth floor, since a noise so discontinuous, so noticeable as blows being struck is heard even in the areas where it is slightly diminished. <laughs> I confess that it bothers me very much to speak to you of such things, and I am more embarrassed by it than I can say. My excuse for doing so today is perhaps first that I haven't done it at all this year, and then that the circulars of the Minister of War follow upon one another so rapidly and so contradictorily that my military situation, already settled three times it seemed, is once again called into question. I await my visit from the Major announced ten days ago, and which has not yet occurred, something that gives me only too many reasons to, to live keeping an ear out, it interferes with my fumigations, which might bother him, since I don't know the day or the hour of his coming, and thus leaves, leaving me more defenseless in the face of my ailments. Following upon your trip, this situation has prevented me from repeating a visit that had left upon me such a charming impression. And your son is no longer here, which saddens me also, for he at least could perhaps have come down if I cannot go up. And I have with respect to him numerous debts which cry out to me about promises not kept. 
and I'll just end with that. Thank you. <laughs> attempt to stand I think. Um, okay so um, uh, s since we're in this gallery surrounded by by um, Alan's paintings with their with their uh, uh, intensely vivid colors I kind of um, came up with a, uh, a kaleidoscope of colors um, for this occasion and the um, the first part is is a uh, is an essay on the color blue that I wrote some years ago um, after William Gass, but before Maggie Nelson um, <laughs> among the blue people, and um, and this was for a project with um, the fabulous Leslie Miller, who's here, and the the artist uh, Terry Winters, and. Um, then from the uh, from this essay on blue, I'm going to transition, as they now say, into a um, a kind of mashup of um, of colors taken from lots of different essays of mine. And then after, and then it ends with a uh, an evocation of the rainbow um, of rainbows, which is. Um, uh, a mashup uh, drawn from um, phrases from Shelley. So it sounds complicated, but it's not that complicated. All right. So here's the blue part, and you know that we're transitioning when uh, when the blue turns into white. <laughs> Go back far enough, and there is no blue. Blue, black, blonde, blaze, the French blanc and even yellow, all derived from one proto-Indo-European word, bell, that which is shining, burning, flashing, or that which is already burnt. Homer's sea is notoriously wine-dark. Odysseus's hair is the color of a hyacinth. Milton, in turn, blind and a classicist, gave his Adam hyacinthine, hyacinthine locks. In most of the languages of Asia, Africa, and the pre-Columbian Americas, there is one word for blue and green. Linguists, with no ear for language, call that word gru. <laughs> Thoreau, quote, Walden is blue at one time and green at another, even from the same point of view. Lying between the earth and the heavens, it partakes of the color of both. Go back far enough and Africans in the European languages are blue. <coughs> Ravens in the Icelandic sagas are blue. In Welsh, glass is the color of the sky, grass and silver. Glass is also vigor, the life force. In Middle English, blue is the color of both the sea and of burnt out ashes. The primary colors for the Mayas and Aztecs were yellow, red, white, and black, the colors of the, of the various kinds of corn they grew. Kandinsky said that blue creates the feeling of supernatural rest. Quote, when it sinks almost to black, it echoes a grief that is hardly human. When it rises toward white, it grows weaker and more distant. Kandinsky cites a Dr. Freudenberg of Dresden who had a patient who could not eat a certain sauce without tasting blue. Kandinsky does not specify the sauce. <laughs> Kandinsky writes, quote, there are, blue, there are pale blue spots on the yellow glare. Only my eyes see the pale blue spots. They did my eyes good. Why didn't anyone else see the pale blue spots on the yellow glare? Blue is a sound. Amy Beach said an A-flat is blue. Rimsky-Korsakov said an E-sharp is blue. Franz Liszt, rehearsing in Weimar in 1842, implored the orchestra to add a little blue. Scriabin said that both a G-flat and an F-sharp are an intense blue. 
B natural, an ordinary blue, and E natural, a sky blue. Painting, said Arthur G. Dove, is music of the eyes. Blue is a sound, blues. Kandinsky said that the sound of a flute is light blue, a cello a darker blue, a double bass an even darker blue, and the organ darkest of all. Thoreau, quote, all sound heard at the greatest possible distance produces one and the same effect, a vibration of the universal lyre, just as the intervening atmosphere makes a distant ridge of earth interesting to our eyes by the azure tint it imparts to it. Blue is the color of Visuddha, the chakra located in the throat. Blue is a snail. In biblical Hebrew, the word for blue is tekeleth, the name of the snail from which a blue dye was derived. The Talmud says these snails appear only once every 70 years. Raoul Dufy, quote, Blue is the only color that maintains its own character in all of its tones. It will always stay blue. Blue is the color of the Persian paradise. In Maori, blue, kikurangi, is when flesh, kiko, joins with the sky, rangi. Questioned by an anthropologist, a Weechol shaman identified Pantone 301C as the blue that is sacred. Shepherds in northern Iraq and remote valleys in the Caucasus Mountains of Armenia, the Yazidis speak Kurdish but do not consider themselves Kurds. They say they come from India, which is why they believe in reincarnation and have strict castes. It is unknown how many there are, for if you ask someone if he is Yazidi, he will not reply. They worship Satan, whom they call Malek Taus, the peacock king, who was forgiven by God and is not evil. They have two sacred books. The only copy of one of them, the Black Book, was stolen centuries ago and taken, they say, to England. But there are men called the talkers who can recite every word of it and they pass it on to their sons. They are forbidden to eat lettuce. They loathe or fear the color blue. The worst curse in their language is, may you drop dead dressed in blue. <laughs> Malevich, quote, I have broken the blue boundary and have come out into the white. Now we transition <laughs> to this, my mashup. Sarasvati, pure water, Sarasvati dressed in white, her face rubbed white with sandalwood paste the brightness of a thousand moons. Sarasvati astride her swan, Sarasvati who never marries, Sarasvati seated on a white lotus, floating above the mud of the world, Sarasvati a blank page. Ragan Hildir dreamed she took a thorn out of her smock and it grew from her hand into a great tree that was red at the bottom, green in the middle, and snow white at the top. Thorstein Uxafoter dreamed that a burial mound opened and a man dressed in red came out. He greeted him pleasantly and invited him into his house. They descended into the mound, which was well furnished. On his right he saw eleven men sitting on a bench dressed in red. On his left he saw twelve men sitting on a bench dressed in blue. In Nahuatl, red and, blank, red and black ink means wisdom. Zebra finches like their males with red legs and females with black legs and are repelled by males with green legs or females with blue legs. An Archibald Bowerbird is especially smitten by a male capable of procuring rare King of Saxony bird of paradise blue feathers to feather the bower. Guppies like their guppies bright orange, pupfish like their pupfish blue, squid like a squid whose skin changes color. A fiddler crab looks for the single giant claw <coughs> turned blue, waving from the beach. Most Germans believe that Hitler had blue eyes, but they were brown. 
The official portrait photographs of high Nazi officials were often retouched to give them blue eyes and that, and that particular stare, cold and pure and cold as a mountain lake, as a glacier, as a cloudless sky, as the fruit of an imaginary unmixed blood. A poem from an unspecified Polynesian island at the turn of the century. The rounded cheeks of your buttocks red as the ripe mountain apple. Your hair deeply waved like the fronds of the curly-leafed mountain fern. Your teeth white as the heron. You are tattooed with bands in black and white like the striped fish of the lagoon. And your whole body is covered with dotted designs like the eel called two lords gliding through the ocean. Zhang Qiu in the second century called himself the Yellow God and led an army of 360,000 followers, all wearing yellow turbans. They brought down the Han Dynasty. Zhang Zhu, a poet in the 13th century, wrote a line, the cataclysm of red sheep, that no one has ever been able to explain. Zhang Xiao, in the 9th century, would paint trees simultaneously using his finger and a worn stump of a brush, one for the living matter, the other for the dead branches and fallen leaves. It was recorded in the 12th century in the collected stories of anomalies that Zhang Tianzi dreamed that a green dog with a long body came from the south and tried to bite him. The flavor of spring is sour, its smell is musty. The emperor lives on the green yang brightness side of the hall of light. He wears green robes and green jade ornaments, rides in a chariot pulled by green dragon horses, jingling with phoenix bells, trailing green steamers, streamers. He eats millet and mutton. His vessels are porous and carved with open work. The imperial ladies move to the eastern palace, wear green clothes trimmed with green, and play zither, zithers and lutes. The flavor of summer is bitter, its smell is burnt. The emperor lives on the hall of light side of the hall of light. He wears vermilion robes and vermilion jade ornaments, rides in a chariot of cinnabar red, pulled by vermilion horses with black tails, trailing vermilion streamers. He eats beans and fowl, his vessels are tall and large. The imperial ladies move to the southern palace, wear vermilion clothes trimmed with vermilion, and play reed pipes and mouth organs. The flavor of fall is pungent, its smell is rank. The emperor lives on the comprehensive pattern side of the hall of light. He wears white robes and white jade ornaments, rides in a war chariot pulled by white horses with black manes, trailing white streamers. He eats sorghum and dog. His vessels are angular and deep. The imperial <coughs> ladies move to the western palace, wear white clothes trimmed with white, and play music on silver bells. The flavor of winter is salty. Its smell is putrid. The emperor lives on the dark hall side of the hall of light. He wears black robes and black jade ornaments, rides in a black chariot pulled by black horses with black manes, trailing black streamers. He eats millet and pork. His vessels are wide and deep. The imperial ladies move to the northern palace, wear black clothes trimmed with black, and play musical stones. Lorca. La naranja es la tristeza del azahar profanado. The orange is the sadness of its violated blossom. Pues se torna fuego y rojo que antes fue puro y blanco. For what was once pure and white turns fire and red. An orange is green and only turns orange when the weather cools. The color is named after the fruit. The fruit is not named after the color. Above Dragon Hill, he saw a golden staircase leading to the sky. Around midnight, he saw something in the shape of a man holding an enormous lamp that changed from pink to white to yellow to green and was bright enough to light the forest in the valley below. 
Then the lamp rose until it was directly in front of him. Its colors fused, its light condensed. It looked like the garnet held in the claws of the great green lizard. He saw a five-colored cloud and a wheel of white light that spun away and kept turning. A storm blew in with winds so strong, Zhang thought the mountains themselves would topple over. He saw a red light on a distant peak. He saw a single white light the color of silver, a pair of golden lights, an array of lights like a string, what I want to use from, from that. And, um, and then uh, I, I don't take notes, but I kind of know where things are. And so I put them, put them so it's partly good memory and partly that you're immersed in it as yeah, at right. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's pretty much it. <laughs> and it's just, uh, you know, one thing leads to another. If you're researching something, one thing leads to another. And, you know, I read the footnotes, and that always gets me from one place to another place. And, and so then you, if you come across something that you want to follow up in a different piece, you kind of can remember where it Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, the yeah, part yeah. I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> um, I just remember by looking at the books on the shelf. That's kind of, like, that's kind of my external hard drive. Yeah, <laughs> that's my mnemonic device. That's the external hard drive. So my books are in incredibly obsessive order. <laughs> and um, and uh, so I can kind of look there, and that's how I re remember things. You know? So if I'm outside of, of, you know, if I'm not next to my books, and you ask me a simple question, like, who is the author of Moby Dick, then I probably can't remember, you know, if I'm there. So your room, your room, your, or rooms are like compartments of your mind, yeah, externalized. Yeah, yeah. But you must have to go buy the books. What? You must have to go somewhere to get the books. <laughs> no, I do go out. <laughs> Rarely, but you know, it's like this is. I'm five minutes from where I live, so I can come here. Um, the uh, yeah, and of course these days, I mean, the, the great thing of the internet is is that you can get any book. So that, I mean, that kind of changed one. One used to depend on chance much more in used bookstores, and then of course with Abe and all of these things, if you see a reference to some book, then you can immediately order it. So that's kind of changed everything. Well, I think that's a nice note to end on. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. to, um, <laughs>